first presentation will examine um, what we consider to be the drivers of hospital expenditure in Ireland, uh, which I hope should provide a, a good foundation for some of the, the presentations to follow later on. Um, okay, just by way of background, so um, all the research uh, presented here today, and as has kind of been outlined by Brian or, or by, by Alan earlier, um, is funded through the DSRI research program and healthcare reform, which began in 2014. Uh, and the broad objectives of that program are to apply economic analysis um, to explore issues in relation to health services, to health spending, and population health, and to develop um, the government's uh, healthcare reform agenda. Um, I guess the first ask from that program was, was to look at um, the potential costs of introducing universal health insurance in Ireland. From that piece of work, there was a need identified um, to develop a medium term projection model for Ireland. A healthcare projection model um, and working that began in, in 2015, the Hippocrates model. Um, and as Alan and, and, and Marsh have outlined, kind of the, the model has been developed in, incrementally, incrementally. So the first, um, first task really was to develop a profile of, of demand for healthcare services and, and project on that demand. Uh, and that research was published in 2017, uh, where we looked at uh, projections of demand for, for health and social care in Ireland out to 2030. Uh, the model was then developed further to look at, um, based on those demand projections, uh, projections of acute hospital capacity in both the, the public system and the private system. Uh, and then more recently, the model has been for, further developed and further refined um, to examine projections of expenditure and projections of acute hospital expenditure. Um, that would be the focus of, of today's, um, today's conference. Okay, so Hippocrates uh, is, is, is developed as a macro simulation model, which is a very popular class of, of model used to project healthcare expenditure internationally. Um, and I guess fundamentally what that means is that we develop age and, and, and sex related activity profiles. So in this context, um, activity could be, um, could be an ED visit, it could be an outpatient visit, it could be a hospital, an inpatient hospital stay. Um, and we develop age profiles at as disaggregated level as possible, so um, by single year of age where the data allow. At the same time, then we develop um, associated cost profiles. So what's the, what's the, the average cost of, of an inpatient day? What's the average cost of, of an outpatient visit? And the idea then is that we project our activity and we project our cost for each projection year. And for each projection year, we combine our projections of activity and, and cost into projections of expenditure. Uh, and to do this, we need an understanding um, of the drivers of activity or, or demand in a projection context and cost. Um, so this presentation will provide an overview of these drivers uh, and how they're incorporated into properties. And also, you know, given its relevance, how we adjust for, for the impact of COVID-19 uh, in both the short and medium. So this next session, uh, this next section now covers the, the main drivers of, of healthcare expenditure that have been identified and how we incorporate those drivers into our model. Okay, so our drivers of, of health and hospital care expenditure can be, I guess, neatly split into, into demographic and non-demographic components. So your demographic components are things like population size, so the more people in the country, the more demand and expenditure on healthcare, and the population age structure, so broadly older populations tend to spend more on healthcare, but also the relationship of health rates. So as, as, as populations age, how does demand or expenditure on healthcare change? Your non-demographic drivers are then pretty much everything else. Um, so income, so as, as, as there's a lot of evidence showed as, as countries become richer, they tend to demand more health-related goods and services, and so expenditure increases. Relative prices are important. So again, there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that um, prices for healthcare tend to outstrip price growth for other goods and services, and that drives healthcare expenditure. Um, technology is an important driver of healthcare expenditure. We'll discuss that a, a bit later on um, in more detail, and policy as well. So you know how a, how, a, how, a, how a system or a country finances its its healthcare system um you know how different kind of models of care delivery and so forth will drive variation in healthcare expenditure also uh, so an important consideration in this analysis and i guess it's, it's important to outline it up front um is how COVID 19 might impact on these drivers um both the short and the medium term 
And I guess while while there's there's uncertainty uh, in in terms of these impacts over the mean over the medium term, we kind of focus on its impacts on 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 a few main components. So in terms of demographics, and um, particularly how COVID might impact on migration, which is the, the biggest driver of population change in Ireland, and Adele will will cover this in, in a lot more detail in the next presentation. Uh, its impact on costs, so this, to the extent that the shock of COVID has impacted on, on important macroeconomic variables um, that feed into things like healthcare pay and non-pay costs, um, which again, which will be important considering uh, for considering in our healthcare modelling. And again, Adele will discuss this in detail in terms of how we do that. Uh, COVID-19 will also um, and has also more directly impacted on demand for healthcare services. And in a number of ways, but I guess what we're really interested in this analysis, this projection analysis, is its impact on unmet demand. So it's, it's impact on waiting lists um, and how we might uh, model that into the future. And Aoife in the second session today will discuss that in a lot of detail. Um, COVID will also have more short term impacts. Okay, so these are, I guess, things that, you know, Hippocrates necessarily can't model because they're not really related to the drivers of, of demand and cost, but we can incorporate their effects into the modeling. Um, so what I'm really talking about here is kind of the big increase in, in healthcare funding um, at the end of last year and, and last year to deal with COVID and then the, the increase in the health budget this year, the kind of 20% increase um, to deal with the effects of COVID. And when we adjust our expenditures um, to account for those shocks, um, I guess what we find is that um, with, with those adjustments, um, the, the, the projected ex expenditure still still falls within our range over the medium term, based on our demand and cost drivers. Um, and I'll, I'll show that later. And I guess it's just it's a reassuring check of a modeling. Okay, so moving on then to to discuss our drivers in a bit more detail. I'm focusing first on on population growth and aging. So um, the plan for healthcare will depend on the number of people in need of care. Um, so that'll be influenced by the size of the population. So as I said, the more people uh, in need of healthcare, the, the greater the expenditure in healthcare in general, uh, but also the health status of the population. And this will be kind of intimately linked to the age and sex structure of, of a given population. So older individuals particularly often require more care. They, they may be more prone to get sick, more prone to multiple mobilities and so forth. Uh, and that'll drive uh, expenditure on healthcare. Uh, and, and the relationship between the age and sex of individuals and their healthcare use can be well displayed by what's known as age and, and sex related expenditure curves. Uh, so here is one of them. So this is a graph from our Hippocrates report showing age related per capita gross expenditure on Irish public hospital services. Um, it's probably the first time we're seeing a graph like this for Irish public uh, hospital care because one hadn't been developed previously. Um, so what does this graph tell us? Um, so I guess the first thing that jumps out is that spending isn't uniform across the age distribution. Um, so you see, you can see there uh, expenditure per capita increases quite strongly with age as of once you hit kind of 50, 55 years of age and quite dramatically thereafter. Um, but that's not, I guess, not the only, the, the only thing. Demand for care is slightly higher at younger ages um, and maternity years for women. Um, highlighted there, for want of a better phrase, with the, the bump in the middle of the age distribution there for the for the female profile. Um, so really, what what that means is that changes in the population age structure into the future, and particularly aging of the population, um, are likely to drive um, future expenditure. Um, but it's it's not that simple, okay? So um, th there's a bit more nuance to consider. So while the the, the, the an aging population will, will likely increase healthcare use, there's a lot of theory and evidence to support different types of um, relationships between aging and healthcare use. So the most pessimistic of them is what's known as the expansion of morbidity hypothesis, and this assumes that as um, as populations age, as life expectancy increases, all those additional life years um, will be spent on bad health. Uh, so this is really, a, as I said, most, a most pessimistic scenario, um, and it's often termed the failure of success. So while um, you know increases in technology and so forth might expand life expectancy, it doesn't improve the quality of that life. So you have people living longer, but with more chronic disease, for example. 
A more optimistic assumption then is known as the dynamic equilibrium assumption. And this assumes that as life expectancy increases, the number of years in bad health remain fixed. And this is kind of closely tied to the whole notion of proximity to death. So it's not actually aging per se that drives healthcare expenditure. It's actually how far away you are from the end of life. And while the, clo the two are closely related, they're, they're kind of they're separate effects. And there's actually, in terms of hospital expenditure particularly, there's a lot of evidence um, to kind of back up this dynamic equilibrium proximity to death effect. And there's been, there's been kind of studies done in Germany and Switzerland and so forth, where they have the data to link use to, 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 to mortality. Um, they've shown that, you know, independent of age, um, expenditure and use of hospital care um, tends to spike at the end of life. And so this, this, this effect will be important for our model. The most optimistic assumption then is what's known as the compression of morbidity assumption. And this assumes that as, as life expectancy increases, um, the number of years of bad health is kind of compressed down to, to older and older age. Uh, in our modeling and in our scenarios, and you'll see this later, we also introduce one additional um, healthy aging effect. Now, this is no basis in, in, in theory, but we introduce just to introduce more nuance into our, into our projections. Um, and we term this the moderate healthy aging effect. Uh, and this lies kind of between our, our very pessimistic expansion of morbidity uh, and our, our more optimistic dynamic equilibrium. So how do we model these aging effects? Um, so this, this slide shows a, a, fictitious, a fictitious activity rate profile um, for 2035 across the age distribution. Um, this is kind of the same shape as our, our, our per capita expenditure profiles, um, just without the addition of cost. So under our expansion of morbidity, which if you remember is our most pessimistic aging assumption, we assume no, we assume no change in the activity rate profile between 2018, which is our base year, and, and 2035, which is our, our end projection year. So what that really means is people may be living longer due to kind of um, an aging of the population, uh, but with no change in age-specific age hospital or healthcare use. Uh, to model healthy aging effects, then we shift our activity rate profiles down and to the right in proportion to changes in life expectancy over our projection horizon. And this follows an approach developed um, by the European Commission in their healthy aging reports. So under our dynamic equilibrium assumption, we see that any gain in life expectancy is accompanied by an equivalent reduction in morbidity. So kind of put simply, if the gain in life expectancy is one year over our projection horizon, then we assume that an 80-year-old uh, in our projection year, we'll have the health status and therefore the activity rate profile of a 79 year old in our base year. Um, and you can see there on the graph that for any uh, any given year of age, for older ages, uh, we project lower healthcare use under our dynamic equilibrium. Um, then if you want to model kind of stronger healthy aging effects, so example, a compression of morbidity, um, this, this effect becomes more pronounced in terms of the shift of activity. So for any gain in life expectancy, it's accompanied by a proportionately greater uh, reduction in morbidity. Okay, so moving on now to our, our non-demographic drivers. So the first one I'll discuss here is, is what's known as Beaumont's cost disease. And, and kind of this, this arises from the, the observation that healthcare prices kind of starkly um, kind of through time and across countries tend to outstrip prices for other goods and services. So why is this? And I guess one of the only theory-based explanations is 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 Baumol's cost disease. And, and, and kind of Baumol uh, kind of said, well, look, what, what's important to consider here is is productivity differentials between sectors. So uh, basically. Uh, wages in in low productivity people dependent sectors like healthcare need to rise to keep pace with wage growth in more productive sectors of the economy in order to sure, ensure recruitment and retention. And Bohm will explain this by means of a string quartet. And he pointed out that the number of musicians needed to play a, a, a Beethoven string quartet today is the same as it was kind of back in the 19th century. Um, but the productivity of classical music performance hasn't, hasn't, hasn't changed. Uh, on the other hand, the wages of musicians and, and, and other professions also um, have increased greatly since the 19th century. So why is this? Well, uh, it's really to ensure that musicians remain in their professions uh, and don't go off and work for a Facebook or a Google that this group must wage, uh, must raise its wages um, to keep its talent. Uh, 
Uh, and as I said, this effect is known as bone malt's cost disease. Um, it's used to explain why prices for, for services offered in kind of people dependent professions like healthcare, like the arts, um, keep going up, even though I guess the amount of goods and services that, that each worker generates necessarily has. Uh, and Maeve Allen will discuss this in a bit more detail in, in, in session two in terms of looking at, at, at um, uh, variation in, in, or how Ireland's healthcare uh, expenditure compares in the international context. And really kind of made, uh, the, 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 the evidence from May Van will show is that Ireland's apparent high healthcare expenditure um, driven by, is, 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 is predominantly driven by prices. So themselves kind of, um, uh, for, so particularly wages in themselves a function of Ireland operating um, in a high wage, high cost economy, more so um, than the volume of care delivery. So it's really kind of the, the high pressure on, 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 on healthcare prices that's driving expenditure. Um, more so than actually how much care is being delivered. Uh, and I guess in line with this theory and this evidence uh, in this analysis, in our projection analysis, um, we model uh, pay costs links to, linked to projected government sector, sector earnings uh, in Ireland, which themselves are tied to, to wages in the wider economy as we recover from COVID. And that modeling is done through our ESRI macroeconometric model, Cosmo and Adele will discuss that later on too. Um, so we also place an emphasis then on modelling on the role of technology. Um, so technological progress can happen in a number of ways. So you could think of technological progress in terms of pharmaceutical drugs, or I guess kind of relevant right now in terms of vaccines, in terms of medical equipment procedures, even administrative systems and so on. Uh, and the evidence would suggest that um, technology tends to have a positive effect on healthcare expenditure. And it may impact both demand and cost channels. So you can think of um, technology expanding the range of conditions that are treatable, for example, uh, or through the supply of, of more expensive medical equipment or drugs that, that, that may increase cost. Um, it's actually quite difficult, um, and if you look at the literature, kind of to, to estimate a technology effect. So how do you define technology in the aggregate? How do you measure it? Uh, and as a result, of that, um, a common approach that is applied when you're, you're kind of looking at, at measuring technology is a residual effect, a residual approach. So the idea here is that um, uh, econometrician or statistician or researcher will, will throw everything into an equation that they, they know kind of drives healthcare expenditure. So things like demographics, things like income, things like relative prices. Uh, and then everything that's left unexplained um, is considered to be related to technolo technological growth. So, for example, um, Dibzak and Fitzbarra in 2010 estimate that the impact of technology on top of demographic and income effects stands by 2% per year on growth in healthcare expenditure across EU countries. Uh, and while this might be a tempting approach to adopt in terms of, of parameterizing Hippocrates, I guess a problem with it is, is that when you're estimating technology residual, you're probably also capturing other effects as well. So the impact of policy, for example, the impact of, of institutions and so forth. So I guess the benefit of Hippocrates and, and the fact that we build it up from an activity and a cost base is that we can kind of channel technology, technological effects in certain ways. And for our hospital expenditure projections, the way we do that is we explicitly model a technological effect through channeling, channeling its impact on um, projected hospital drug costs. This is following an approach, um, approach used by the IFS and the Health Foundation in the UK uh, a couple of years ago when they were looking at projections of, of, of NHS healthcare expenditure. So the basic idea is that the delivery of new, innovative, technologically advanced drugs um, will impact hospital costs disproportionately. So a good example of this would be in the area of cancer care, where new oncology drugs are coming on stream all the time. And while they may provide better outcomes, uh, they do so at a cost. Uh, and we have some justification, I guess, for, for adopting this approach uh, in terms of Irish expenditure. So, um, for, for the years we have data, and this data is sourced from, from Healthcare Pricing Office, uh, their special, specialty cost data. And for the years we have it, kind of 2015 to 2018, we can see that in terms of acute expenditure, um, expenditure on drugs and medicines, the unit cost increase over the period um, was kind of 5.2%, uh, which was a higher, higher annual average growth rate than for other non-pay items, 3.2%. So we do have some justification for modeling 
trends in hospital drugs um, distinctly from other non-pay items. And I'll show that later on and its effect. Um, so what about policy considerations? Um, so the assumptions so far have not considered explicitly kind of any, any models of care change or reform. Um, but we look at this in, in our analysis in two main ways. Um, so the first is relating to, to, to waiting list management. So as, as many of you may be aware, shortages in acute care capacity over the last number of years have contributed to the large and longer waiting lists for public hospital treatment. Uh, and these effects have been exacerbated by COVID. So um, in order to make room for, for kind of COVID hospital cases, a lot of the, the, the non-urgent elective care in public hospitals can cancel. The knock on effect of that is that kind of waiting list has grown and waiting times for care have grown. Uh, and we examine the, these expenditure implications of addressing these waiting list issues. Um, following an approach developed by uh, Rob Finley in the UK is a waiting list expert. Um, and just say equal go into this in a lot more detail later on, but, but really the idea is that we, we look at the issue in terms of two dimensions. So how much once-off additional activity is required to reduce the current backlogs that have built up for accessing public hospital services? And then how much recurring additional activity will be required through our projection or horizon to maintain lower waiting times? And to incorporate that COVID effect I spoke about earlier, we incorporate information on numbers waiting um, at the latest point we could. So the, 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 publica the publication of the report was, was December 2020. We included information on, on numbers waiting for care up as far as October. Um, and I guess then the other main assumption we consider in terms of policy is, is models of care change. So a key recommendation of salon to care is, is the idea that we shift care, appropriate care to hospitals um, through better delivery of primary care service. Um, so I guess the question then is in terms of the modeling, if primary care improves, what impact will that have on hospital demand? And actually the evidence would suggest that's not exactly clear. So both international and national evidence um, would kind of point towards that. So in a national context, kind of ESRI colleagues like Anne Noel and Brendan Walsh and others have, have looked at the effect of increased access to primary care and how it affects use of secondary care services. And, and, and what they show in terms of, you know, individuals gaining a medical card, for example, or a GP visit card, doesn't necessarily reduce use of secondary care services. Um, so just with that kind of warning in mind, but I guess the best evidence we have, internationally at least, is that better primary care and stronger primary care systems are often associated with fewer avoidable hospitalizations. So these are conditions for which good primary and community care can prevent the need for hospitalization. Uh, and kind of, kind of very detailed um, hype data, so hospital administrative data kind of informing this analysis. And from that, from that data set, we we're able to identify, identify the three main avoidable hospitalizations as they relate to Ireland. These consume kind of substantial amount of hospital resources every year. So those are vaccine preventable influenza and pneumonia, urinary tract infections and, and, and COPD. So I guess the idea in this, in, in, in this bit of the modeling is that we look at reducing the rates of these avoidable hospitalizations through time under assumed approval. So just to give you an idea of that, so in, in, in 2018, uh, those three avoidable hospitalizations accounted for 70% of all complexity weighted avoidable discharges. Um, so that amounted over kind of 600,000 bed days in 2018 um, at a cost of just under 300 million, excluding kind of uh, additional emergency department costs. So again, the idea is we, we reduce those rates of avoidable hospitalizations through our projection line. Okay, so just to just to kind of uh, quickly summarize, um, so and I know we're kind of already running a bit over time. Um, demographic and non-demographic factors are likely um, to drive hospital expenditure. So population growth and aging will be important, um, but also it's important to consider healthy aging. So as populations age, it's important to consider how use of healthcare services. Uh, in terms of non-demographic drivers, then we talked about kind of BOMAL, the whole issue of relative prices. Um, technology being an important driver and how we're going to model hospital drug drug costs distinctly from other non-pay drivers and policy. So our kind of our two big policy considerations here is looking at the extra activity and cost that'll be associated with reducing waiting lists through time. Uh, and then also kind of um, 
the, the, the whole impact of, of, of assumed improvements in primary care and what effect that might have on, on future demand for, for acute care settings. Uh, we also adjust for COVID in the short and medium term, so to its, its, its impact on, on demographics, on, on, on macroeconomic variables, and, and in relation to unmet demand for hospital care. So that brings me on nicely now uh, to, 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 to kind of wrap up and, 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 and on to our next presentation where Adele will discuss uh, the demographic and macroeconomic scenarios um, that feed into, in, in, into a property in a bit more detail.